Hi, um, I'm Ken Johnson. Thank you for coming. Uh, today we're going to talk about file history and, and how to deconstruct its database catalog. So I am a senior associate at KPMG. Uh, I examine evil. I chase the bad guys. I have malware. I look at your network and tell you everything that you're doing wrong. Um, depending on which client you ask, I'm a harbor, harbinger of bad news. They don't like me at all. Especially when I'm on a plane, getting ready to fly out, and I say, hey, check this IP. Yeah, we see it. Yeah, it's bad. You're infected. No, we're not. How do you know that? It's a zero day. I, I know things. So today, we're going to identify the key artifacts of the file history catalog um, and how we can use that for forensic analysis to actually see what files were on our system without doing a deep dive onto the EMF2 file tables. So file history, what is it? It is a backup solution that is integrated into Windows 8, 8.1, Windows 10, and more than likely anything else Windows puts out in the future. It is off by default, but it's enabled per user, by user. Um, it does automatic backups, and it's very configurable. You can decide how long you're going to retain the backups, your, how long um, it backs up for, the frequency that it backs up, where it backs up. So when you're going to configure file history, if you're looking at it initially, this is what it looks like to get your file history off. In this case, I would be backing up to my removable disk drive E. Um, that's the size I got to back up in. <coughs> um, in Windows 10, it's a little bit cleaner. And this says it's on. Again, I'm backing up to my removable drive E when I last backed up. For the difference between Windows 8 and Windows 10, Actually now in Windows 10, I can click Run Now instead of having a set one. So it allows me to, if I make changes, and I, let's say I have a, it backs up every six hours. If I need to do it now, I can do that. Um, this is what it looks like when it's on on Windows 8. Again, we don't have the Run Now option. So our file history is we can decide how frequently it backs up. Every 10 minutes, 20 minutes, hour, every 12 hours, once a day. Um, how much of the disk space it's going to write to and cache locally. The reason it'll cache locally is if my backup location is not available, such as the network issue being down, you don't have the thumb drive plugged in. Um, how often, or how long it'll be retained for? So are we going to do a monthly, delete every year, every two years, or if we're going to require the user to delete these files? So again, file history benefit. It's not a Mac backup when it's turned on. Um, once you have it turned on and enabled, you can forget about it as long as it's got the connection. Once it reconnects, it backs up. It'll create a new version for your file that you back up. Um, it also retains all your previous versions. Um, like I said, it's good to be back up user data. It lessens the impact. It's a lot easier to recover, and it's integrated into Windows 8, Windows 10. Um, one of the reasons why there's a lesser impact is in the enterprise environment, if we are nice malware coming through and the machine gets infected, you can quickly restore back and not lose any of your user data. So, <clears throat> again, virus executed, the system restored, go back to the file history, we're back to normal. So, artifacts created with you, when you use file history. We've got registry entries, we have some event logs, we've got our configuration data, our catalog databases, and our non-sync data. The non-sync data will only be on the host, not on the backup location. So on the storage location, we've got our configuration files, our catalog database, and our sync data. This is where we can find our artifacts. Okay. Um, on the host, it will be under the user profile of the account that started it into the file history or into remote storage. For example, um, we got my file history testing, the new location, my username, the machine it's from. And I, beneath that, I've got my configuration and my data sets. Um, within the configuration data, you have catalog one, catalog two, which are identical backups, and config one and config two, which are identical. Um, the configuration, that's what the configuration file looks like. It will tell you when it's backing up, where it's backing up from, what directories it's backing up. By default, Windows 10 will back up all the directory that Microsoft creates, so your documents, desktop, favorites. It also will do if you've got live, it'll back up anything from your live directory that's stored locally as well. 
that's new in Windows 10. Um, also tells you where it's going to back up to. Um, so in here we've got the username, the friendly name. The friendly name is inherited if I'm using a Windows Live account. So whatever my Windows Live ID is, this is what will show there. The PC name that is turned on. The user ID is unique to the PC that you're on. Um, again, in the libraries, we have our videos folder, our music, our documents. This is all default windows. If I do a new one, um, this will be called a user file. Uh, the catalogs are under the configuration catalog one, catalog two databases. The size that we're going to be backing up to, how much we're going to allow it to use. In this case, it tells you um, if the retention policy is disabled, enabled, how long we're going to retain it for, the frequencies in seconds, um, and if it's enabled. This is where we're backing up to. In this case, it's a remote server. That's the file path on that remote server. We can see that the host share file history new location is where I'm backing up to. When the drive is at 98% full, it'll give me a nice warning. That's what it looks like if it's a removable drive. So remote drive, it says target drive is remote. For removable, it's removable. It also gives you the good of the volume. Um, this is what it looks like when you look at the backup folder. As you see, each one of our directories has their own directories in there. Um, this is what our files look like. Each one is appended with the UTC time of when it was backed up. So our catalog, which is very important, it contains every transaction that it's done on its backup, when it's backed it up, the strings, the file paths, and this allows you to actually figure out what was on the box, what's now no longer on the box, the duration it was on the box, or at least in the location. And like I said, this can be found in our catalog one database uh, file path. Um, I use either OneWare or Nearsoft on mine. The OneWare, it throws some errors using Windows 8, Windows 10, um, unless I do it from a thumb drive. Once I do it from a thumb drive, it's fine. But I can export all my tables from at once. The Nearsoft, um, I've never had an issue with it on any OS I've ran it on, um, but I have to export my tables individually. So this is what It looks like in my uh, this one. in the one where I can actually browse to my different tables and get my information. At this point, it's very confusing. You have to bounce back and forth tables to understand what you're looking at. Um, this is what Nearsoft looks like. Nearsoft is almost as convoluted and confusing. But again, this is, tells you when it was backed up. Um, doing this research and looking at it, you're bouncing back and forth between the tables, making notes. It's fine if you only have half a dozen entries, but considering it backs up everything in those directories, including the desktop I and I very quickly it gets unmanageable. So our catalog tables are the MySys objects, the backup set, file, global, library, namespace, and strings. Strings is pretty much the only one that is what it sounds like. It's the strings of the file paths, uh, file names. Um, the MySys object is basically our data schema. There's very limited information in there from an analyst aspect. From the backup, this allows you to backup the session number, um, timestamp, and so you can understand when the time and when the backup process ha happened. Um, so it also be able to compare when it was there, when it's not there. The table columns on there is ID and timestamp. For the file table, it tracks our information related to the files that we're backing up. Um, 
last known file path on the host, file size, when it was backed up. Um, got the ID, the parent, the child, the state. Um, the T capture is the cycle that it was first found in. Um, the TQ is if we're waiting for it to be backed up. So if you do not have your back location there, when it was queued, um, as long as it's been backed up, there will not be a queue entry there, or a valid queue entry, it'll be the most recent one. And the TF data is when it was last updated. Um, the global is the last successful backup time, the target directory size, and other values based on where you're backing it up to. Um, here's our global tables. It's quite a bit of information, but it's there's only like four or five fields that you're interested in. The library table, it tracks the individual libraries that can be backed up. So whenever you add a new one, it'll be entered into here based on a string and everything else. Um, if the child ID, the ID for the table, when it was created, is it still visible? Um, if there's any number in there besides the value of the 2147, that value is when it was last seen in that path. So if they move it, it'll change to a new path, which then for update to a new entry. So the namespace table, it tracks our information related to the file, the library location. Um, it'll include the file name, the path, the attribute metadata, um, the map times for the file. So this is important if you're doing some file analysis on, hey, when was this on my box? Um, all that's stored into the database. That way, again, you don't have to do your MFT, you don't have to recover it, it's all right here. It's all based off the US internal value for the file. Um, the namespace, the file attributes, we share that. Again, this is the original file, not the backed up file. It's file as it was on your host machine. When it was created, when it was modified, um, the parent ID, the status of it, when it was first there, the user journal entry that it was created in or updated in. Um, and the string table is again, it's the file path, file directory, file name, all in the common string. So when I do my analysis on this, I look at the backup set, the namespace, the strings, and the file. So the old way, before I started doing some access, or Excel, I guess, was to come in here, um, So right here on our namespace, um, the child ID of 20 to 38 for the file attributes, so we're looking for. Child ID of 20, parent ID of 21. I would have to then come back to my namespace, or my strings. And we'd have to come down here, so file 20 was my desktop INI, and it was in My links. UP is user profile. PP is um, public profile. So if you see those, you understand, uh, give you an idea where they're stored at. This gets very time consuming when we are doing our research. So I said if you've got multiple ones, you're tracking notes. So I went on ahead and created a spreadsheet that will do all the analysis for us. This is what it looks like. Um, you, you start having to upload or, or import the values of each of the tables that you want to record. And then once they're all input, you go into the initial tab. And let's hope. So now we have our values. Um, we have my file here, which was found in this location. 
it, that was the user journal entry value on when it was modified. This is the, when it was created based on the map time of the file, the original file. Um, this is when it was last modified. This is the first file history instance that it was found in. Um, this is the last one. So if it shows, if we've got date in here, it was either moved or deleted from that location. So now we can actually quickly run through and see what files we still have in the box, where it was at, whether or not it's still present without having to go back and cross-reference the strings to the backup sets, to the namespace. Um, so it's much quicker, it's much easier. And when you're done, we actually have a cleanup. And it goes through and deletes everything. So you can save it off and then you're ready for the next one. And we're done. So any questions on this aspect? Yes? So is the application of this really, if you were say, boost someone's flash drive that they've been backing up to, you could go through this and easily pull out password sensitive data or? You could do that. Um, your law enforcement, you grab a box, the guy says, uh, no, I don't have any kiddie porn on here. Um, I've deleted it. Oh, look at these thumb drives. Oh, look, in this catalog database, I can actually see your kiddie porn directories. And these are when you had it on here. Or if you find a collection of other thumb drives and you're looking at a single laptop and you come across three different file histories, each pointing back to a different machine, now you've got more systems you can actually look at. Because now you know where else he's had access to, what else he's backing up to. With this pulling back the window, or the uh, OneDrive from Microsoft, anything that he has on the cloud that he also has synced locally, you now can have a copy of. So it gives you a better idea of what's there. Um, usually if you want to know if a file has been on a system that's deleted, you either drop it into uh, in case FDK, Xways, and look to see if it's in deleted files, or you carve the MFT, the user journal. If it's in a location that's being backed up, it will show up here. If it was in the backup cycle. Um, so that way you don't have to carve the MFT. You don't have to pull that out. This is one file you have to pull. Yes, sir. Um, so the question is, can I lock this down using group policy? Unfortunately, it's either on or it's off by group policy. Nope, it's either on or it's off. Um, Microsoft, it's, there's been talk that they may change that, but their idea is they want a user to be able to quickly back it up. Um, there's a lot of risk right now with in, in the enterprise allowing the users to enable it, uh, just because people are not backing up to secure locations. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, once again, talking about the subject of security, you know, I guess it's a cool feature, thanks Microsoft for offering it, but do they offer any sort of encryption option for it on that level too? If you are backing up to an encrypted drive, it's encrypted. It's your responsibility yeah. for encryption. So the question was, does Microsoft offer any encryption into it? It's like almost any other backup software. If you want encryption, you have to add it. Yes, sir. Could it be used um, trying to recover files if you had a uh, ransomware related to this file? Depends on where it's backed up and how bad that. The, so the question was if um, my file or my machine is compromised by ransomware, can I use this to back it up? So. Like I said, it depends on where it's being backed up to. If the ransomware has already infected that backup location, you're, there's, there's nothing we can do. Um, if you back it up nightly to a thumb drive and you disable, remove that thumb drive, there's a chance you can pull it back. Um, Windows 8, does anybody have Windows 8, Windows 10 in the enterprise? Or any familiarity with it? Um, so with Windows 8, they released three, total three different recovery options. Um, you have your old standby of the restore point that we all know and hate. Um, then they also offered a refresh and a reset. So they refresh, there's two options with that, either the default system refresh or a custom refresh. The default is everything that 
It's been installed on the box. It's from Microsoft. When you go to refresh it, it reverts everything back or anything you bought from the Microsoft store. So your office appliances are there, but your custom, um, so like when I redo my forensic box, my in case has to be reinstalled. All my malware tools have to be reinstalled um, if I use that option. Or I can do a custom option, and that's where I install my system, get it exactly how I want it. Then I create a gold build. That's it, my back, my refresh. So now if I ever get hit with a virus or my yearly clean up my stuff, I just refresh back. Um, I've had some luck in ransomware um, doing that, but not enough to feel safe with. For, for me, if I'm getting hit with ransomware, it's, it, I'm just blown it away. And it's, I'm, not, I'm not concerned about it. Of course, I keep my data in like five different areas, so it's paranoia. Um, they also offer a, what is it, refresh, reset. The reset is their rewipe and reinstall of the OS. Um, it either does the mark everything as deleted and install a brand new OS, or it's do a, a random wipe across the hard drive and then install the OS. So Microsoft's got some options for recovery, but if you're using file history and you're backing up to a remote location, and then let's say you do a reset or a restore, um, the restore you'll actually keep your user created files, so you don't lose that. But on a reset, I can then link back to my file pa or my file directory or file history directory, and then restore everything from there. So there's options, but again, it's malware. How safe do you honestly feel? I mean, you've already gotten in there once. Are you, are you sure you've gotten rid of it? My, my, my belief is if I've gotten infected, I'm blown it away. So, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. So, file history, so empty version or creative version? File history in Windows 8 is the new version of previous previous version. They, they've kind of rolled it away. Yeah. It still runs on the same concept. Um, it sounds like it. That's what I was asking. Yeah, but it's... It's fancy a little. It, it is. Uh, at the same time, it's, it's the same thing. So this is one of my backup locations. And as you can see, we've got, it, it, it'll append it with the most recent timestamps. I can actually have multiple versions in there. Um, and this is stored offline. And there is a way to, so, so Microsoft decided that if you have OneDrive, you can't back up to OneDrive using file history because they don't trust OneDrive. You also can't back up to a hard drive on the local machine. Again, if your machine gets compromised, you want to be able to save it. But actually, if you map those back as like a network share, Microsoft doesn't understand that, and you can back it up to OneDrive, you can back it up to another, uh, another hard drive on your box. Any other questions? Okay, so let's do the dangers. And, and this is what I love about file history. So there is a configuration point of file history that once you know what you're looking for, it becomes very dangerous and it's fun from a red team aspect. So in our configuration file, the line that I like is this string right here. Uh, that's the one I get the best hits on. So we go to Google, we type in that string, and it's actually gotten some more, gotten better. But this used to be what I'd see on all of them. So we have our unsecured NAS that they're backing up Windows 8 to, or Windows 10, they're backing up all their files to. Um, there's our configuration file. <laughs> so then I go to, let's see, configuration. I'm pull where I can actually see it. So on Dan's laptop, and I feel I have the right to pick on Dan because I've talked to Dan before. Our 
Chica. So it, it's kind of fun from user standpoints, but uh, last year I presented this at um, ISIS and ACES in Atlanta, and that's a big physical and digital security conference. And I was going through my deck and I was looking at some of my use cases, my demos of this. I'm like, that company name looks familiar. They were one of the vendors downstairs. Um, one of their CEOs who left like four years previously had all of his data, that had all of their data. I knew their financials for the last 15 years. I knew all their HR. I knew everything about this company. Um, because they allowed, again, this, this goes back, it's not a file history issue in itself. It's an end user issue. It's a security around our data. Once he left the network, once he left the company, he should never have the access to it anyway but it was being backed up on his own home server, on his home boxes, to a NAS. Based on timestamp and everything else, recon, he hadn't touched it in years, but that doesn't mean I didn't access it. It doesn't mean somebody else didn't access it. So I went down and actually talked to him. At first, they didn't believe me, so they sent somebody up to my talk. Um, and I, I blacked out all their data, but the guy's like, that name does look familiar. So when he came up, I actually showed him where it was after the talk. So it, it's that whole thing is, this is a great tool, but in an enterprise level, if you're not securing it, if you're not locking it down, and you allow your users to back up to a location you're not controlling, it's a very good chance that this data is out. When I first started doing this research about 18 months ago, I had 10 pages on Google of this data, and it was the first 10 pages. Um, it's gone down, now I don't see nearly as many, I'm disappointed. Um, there's an FTP site that actually We'll grab all these because they see these as FTPs and you can search on this and I, I've seen Fortune 10 data out there um, because we're pushing data out to our users. We're not understanding what we're giving them permission to and we're afraid to lock things down. So from an attacker standpoint now, since I now know how to deconstruct a catalog, I can get any data set up there. I can know what else he's had access to. I can know if he's actually worth trying to fish, trying to get more information from, and what else may be on that computer that I may have interest in. So this is all fun, it's all games, but it's also very dangerous in what we do. So any questions on that aspect? All right, thank you. Let's talk. 